for class. It's being recorded. I'm going to start again. My name is, thank you. Welcome, everyone. We're so pleased that you came to join us. I, my name is Maggie Gallagher. I'm the executive director of the Benedict 16th Institute for Sacred Music and Divine Worship, which was founded by Archbishop Salvatore J. Cordelioni. Um, our mission is opening the door of beauty to God through more beautiful and reverent liturgy and by helping to energize a Catholic culture of the arts. And I know that in we, we're, we're so proud to be here with Sir James McMillan and so grateful. And with these 12 uh, fine uh, North American sacred music composers, but I'm also very aware that in the audience today, there are uh, an extremely distinguished group of composers, artists, uh, scholars of music, um, and uh, music directors of major cathedrals here in the United States. And we appreciate uh, your, the gift of your attention today. And we hope you stay in touch with us as we move into the future. Um, the, the way today is going to work goes roughly like this. I'm going to get out of the way as soon as I can. Uh, Archbishop Cordelioni will uh, probably say a few words and definitely lead us in an opening prayer. He has confirmations later, so he will have to, he can't unfortunately stay for the whole event and we'll have to watch it on our YouTube channel once we put the recording up there. Um, and uh, I wanted to say, so after the Archbishop, I will introduce all the panelists only with their very brief bios. We will send to all of you who have registered to attend a longer bio that will include links where you can hear their work and learn more about them and contact them if you have uh, further interest in learning more about what they, the amazing creative work that they are doing. And then I will introduce our composer in residence, Frank LaRocca, to introduce Sir James. And our goal here is not to have a mere lecture uh, with a Q&A format. There will be a public lecture on May 29th uh, with Sir James, uh, co-sponsored with the uh, School of Pastoral Ministry. Deacon Fred Toda and Martin Ford were instrumental in putting both of these events together. So I wanna shout out to them. Um, but for this event, we really would like to simply watch as Catholic creatives uh, pursue their calling and converse with each other about the task of bringing us closer to God through the creation of sacred music and all that that entails. So Archbishop Cordelioni, uh, will you lead us in prayer? Okay, yes. Thank you, Maggie. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, during these days, between the celebration of your ascension, when you return to your Father in glory, and the day of Pentecost, when you gave the gift of your Spirit, as you had promised to the Church, we ask you to grant us the grace to have a deeper longing for your presence, and a greater docility to the movements of your Spirit in our lives. Help us to be wise stewards of the talents you have entrusted to us. Help us to be agents of your beauty that all might see you and to recognize your beauty reflected in the beauty of creation, reflected in the beauty of your truth. Bless our hands with success that all we do might be for your glory and lead people to a deeper intimacy with you. We give you thanks for coming among us as you were born of your mother whom you gave to us as our mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace the Lord is Lord with thee. Blessed art thou, thou among women, women, and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary mother, mother of God, of God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners. now and at the hour of death. death. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray for Amen. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Uh, very deep and sincere thanks to Sir James McMillan for um, being willing to, if I may use the word, conduct this uh, session uh, for uh, composers. Uh, I'm so 
really grateful to you. So happy and excited about this coming together. As Maggie said, I have confirmation coming up at the cathedral. I'm actually between confirmations right now. It's been a great blessing for me to be able to return to doing confirmations. I went for over a year without doing confirmations. And this is one of the more prominent parts of a bishop's uh, responsibilities. And it's always a happy occasion um, to be with the young people when they're being confirmed. So I, give, I usually put together a, the same basic homily every year for confirmation. And I'm emphasizing this time the, my, my recurrent theme of the three transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness and all the truth, beauty, and goodness that the church has given to the world. And uh, I'm, I'm just more and more struck at the power uh, of beauty to transform hearts and to open minds and, tr and to sensitize people to the truth. Uh, these are, I refer to these as like three doors that open up the encounter to Christ. And we need all doors wide open because uh, some people will be drawn more to one and some drawn more to the other. And uh, some people do, they, they read and then they, their minds are open and they, they accept the truth. They go through the door of, of truth and the church has always been the leader in works of charity and uh, works of mercy. And some people encountering that goodness of the church come through that door. But we really need to open that door of beauty a lot wider. I think that's the door that's been, been closed. And uh, I'm, I'm struck more and more at how the, the, the classical beauty of the church um, in, in all forms, um, but especially in music, how that, that, that connects or people connect with that so well. And I, I'm happy to see a beginning renaissance of this. Uh, I think we, we tried for a while doing very contemporary music and so that was a new thing. And of course, what's new today is old tomorrow. And that's beginning to look very old now. But new means what you're about. Uh, what is new and a value is new in continuity with the, the tradition. So it, it, it's in, in continuity, it's in line with that tradition, it preserves the, the elements of that tradition, but then pushes it forward in a new way that somehow reflects the elements of the time that we are in. So it's both relatable to today and it has timeless beauty to it. So what you're doing to me is of the utmost importance for the church right now. With all the travails we're going through in society and in the church as well, with all the, the confusion and dissension and uh, people not living their faith fully as they should, I think the most important thing we can do is to reach them through beauty. And music is just so powerful uh, way to do that. So thank you for using your talents to give glory to God and further the work of the gospel. And I'm going to listen um, for a while and until I finally get up enough, enough um, motivation to reluctantly leave the meeting and go on to other things. But, but I'll listen for as long as I'm not able to force myself away. Thank you so much, Archbishop. I, I kind of like to think that Benedict 16 provides a lot of the fun parts of your job. <laughs> um, and, uh, the, uh, it's my uh, honor and pleasure now to introduce uh, Frank LaRocca. Frank is uh, the Benedict 16 composer in residence. And in that respect, I just wanna shout out uh, a, a couple of major um, opportunities to hear his work. Uh, one of the things that Benedict XVI does, which is unusual, is we have committed to celebrating or, or offering sacred music only in the context for which it was written as prayer, not performance. Uh, not that there is anything wrong with concerts. It's wonderful uh, and a way to reach many people who are not going to church. But we will be, uh, the Archbishop has commissioned uh, Frank to compose a Requiem Mass for the Homeless, which we will be praying together on November 6th at the Great Cathedral of St. Mary's in the Assumption. We will have a conference afterwards at St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park, and you're all invited to come. Uh, we would love to see certainly all of the panelists, but anyone in the audience too. That, that's a big cathedral, St. Mary's. Uh, 
I think it, with standing room, it, we could probably fit 5,000 and God willing, we'll be able to be together in uh, large groups again in the United States at that point. On January 15th, the first uh, mass commissioned by the Archbishop from Frank LaRocca, the Mass of the Americas, which is a twin tribute to Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, the patroness of the United States, and Our Lady of Guadalupe, who is the patroness of Mexico, many other countries, and of course, of all the Americas. Um, and that will be in the extraordinary form at Old St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City on January 15th. So we think that will be a significant spiritual event in the life of the church and we'd welcome your participation. Um, several of the composers here, Daniel Nags and Jeffrey Quick and Mark Nowakowski were commissioned by Frank uh, to offer uh, new musical uh, settings to uh, text for a Lenten prayer service that's not yet scheduled. And then the other, the next mass, new mass by Frank will be a mass for St. Junipero Serra, which I believe will be celebrated July 1st of next summer. So forgive me, we're very, very proud of Frank and his work and his collaboration directly with the Archbishop, which I think is kind of a classic model for the church. Frank, would you introduce the great Sir James McMillan to us? With pleasure. <clears throat> of course, he's known to everybody here on the panel, but it, it's worth saying that Sir James McMillan is a creative figure who's really unique in our day. He's among the top five most performed living classical music composers, um, even occupying the number two position for a number of years. In both his music and in his considerable body of writings, he represents a bridge between seemingly incompatible worlds. That is, in the highly secularized environment of modern classical art music, he is a devout, publicly confessing Catholic, and um, in fact, a third order Dominican. While fulfilling commissions for many of the leading musical institutions in the world, he simultaneously spent years composing simple psalm antiphons for a small choir, which he directed in a working class Glasgow parish. While he's a modernist in his approach to composition, he's also a staunch defender of the value of tradition and the arts when rightly understood. He's a member of a religious minority in his home country of Scotland. Only 16% of Scots identify as Catholic. Yet his views on sacred music uh, and the arts and culture are sought out by his majority Protestant or secular colleagues not, as is often the case, because he adopts the easy language of relativism, but rather because of his notably charitable and magnanimous engagement with others. While I was preparing to interview him uh, back in Scotland in 2018, I came across this statement from one of his essays, quote, <clears throat> Mary opens the door to the very heart of God. And in the silence of my own contemplation, in that necessary stillness where all composers know that music mysteriously begins, the following words from our sacred liturgy have lodged themselves in the womb of my soul, trapped in a scarlet room, gestating gently with a tiny pulse. Hail Mary full of grace. Sir James, um, it is a great honor uh, to be able to introduce you. And I know that this is going to be uh, a truly memorable occasion for all involved. Um, so please. Thank you. Forth. Right. Thank, thank you, Frank. It's great to see you again, and it's great to see our fellow composers uh, over there, all over the, the, all over North America. And thank you so much, Archbishop and everyone at the Benedict XVI 
Institute for inviting me uh, to be involved in this tonight. And uh, a big hello to uh, your, your audience. I see the numbers have uh, crept up quite considerably in the last, last few minutes. Uh, it's quite daunting. Um, anyway, um, I get asked a lot to talk about music, as you would expect. And I get asked a lot to talk about sacred music. And sometimes uh, there, there can be some confusion in what one expects from the definition of sacred music, depending on who one's talking to and who, who one is having that conversation with. As we know, um, there is, it's not just within the liturgy uh, that we encounter the sacred. It's not just within the liturgy uh, that, for which uh, sacred music is composed. Um, in fact, most of the time, most of my time, I think, when I am writing sacred music, I'm, I, I'm aware that it will not be used for the liturgy. It will be used and uh, staged and performed in secular <laughs> events like concerts, and it will encounter an audience made up of believers and unbelievers, probably more unbelievers uh, than believers. Uh, and yet there is that uh, understanding uh, within the music loving community that music is one of the most sacred arts. It could even be the most sacred, the most spiritual of the arts. Um, and, and those who love um, art music of, a, of, a, of the Western tradition, and, and again, uh, definitions can complicate matters as we'll no doubt discover as we go on. But nevertheless, within that audience, uh, there is a deep knowledge uh, of where that music has come from uh, and that they may be attending a secular event, but hearing, hearing a Bach Passion or a Mozart Mass, they are cognizant of the fact of where that music has come from culturally. Like it comes from deep within uh, our Christian heritage. Uh, and I think for that matter, right across the board, uh, uh, um, among skeptics as well as believers, there's a great respect for the depth of the tradition which we love. And so um, sometimes I'm asked to define uh, the differences between sacred music and liturgical music, but I'm aware that there's a great interest tonight, uh, sorry, uh, this afternoon where you are, in music for the liturgy. And um, I, 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 would, I would like to address that uh, particular matter uh, in my opening remarks tonight. Our conversations may, may go in many different directions, but I'm aware because this is a, um, a Catholic institution and very much associated with the Archdiocese of San Francisco, uh, that there, are, there will be a great deal of reflection on beauty in the liturgy and in fact music and the arts and how music and the arts allows people to bring their prayers and contemplations to the altar of God. So. Um, uh, I, I'm going to focus, I think, on, 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 on music for liturgy. I'll I, I talk a little bit about my music for the liturgy, maybe even play a little uh, or a few examples uh, of these uh, and, and see where that takes the conversation. So to begin with then, uh, I'm the first to admit that it's quite an odd situation to find oneself being a composer who is at home in the business of serious art music, here's these definitions again, and its modernity, and simultaneously being interested in what might work as functional ritual music in the Catholic liturgy for the times we, we, we live in. Most of my work is geared towards the concert life of our orchestras, our chamber ensembles, our soloists, conductors and choirs. The culture of art music as it evolves now in the 21st century is my intellectual and imaginative home. I write for orchestras and virtuosi, uh, such as the London Symphony Orchestra, for example, in this country and in, over your side of the pond. Recently, I've completed works for the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra and Manfred Honeck and a, a big oratorio for the Pacific Symphony Orchestra just down the coast from you, uh, which is a setting of a specially commissioned poem by Dana Joya. Wow. Um, as well as writing a lot of music for choirs, uh, such as the 16, uh, the, the British, Great British Choir, the BBC Singers and so on. In earlier times, this kind of work would naturally overlap with composing music for liturgy. Whether it be the, the weekly cantatas written by J.S. Bach, 
for Lutheran worship or the regular masses and motets composed by Palestrina right through to Mozart, through to Bruckner and beyond through history. I don't think we need to rehearse the historical and cultural reasons why there have been breaches between ecclesial authorities and classical composers. Gradually over the decades, one uh, present company excluded, of course, one has become more and more disinterested in the other. So much so that it is thought unusual to find composers enthusiastically pursuing both aspirations. It might only be recently that this breach has become serious. As we can think of many composers, even as late as the 20th century, who followed the two paths, such as Poulenc and Messiaen in France, Benjamin Britten here in the United Kingdom, and even Stravinsky with his mass setting and little motets like Ave, his Ave Maria and his Pater Noster. With the Second Vatican Council came um, other uh, breaches though, and, and, and please be assured I'm not going to be critical of uh, any of the, um, the, the Council's decisions and, and developments. This is not an anti-Vatican II talk, you'll be pleased to hear. It has, but it has become almost impossible for the church to interest the, the contemporary art composer, present company, company excluded, in writing, for example, new congregational music for the liturgy. Choral music still has its attractions, even for the most complex of modernists. And I'm particularly thinking of British composers like Peter Maxwell Davies, who was a, a great friend and mentor of mine, and, but certainly no friend of the church. Uh, I have uh, the scars uh, from some of our um, uh, encounters and arguments about that. Nevertheless, he wrote a mass setting for Westminster Cathedral. And Jonathan Harvey, for example, another great English composer, had a natural Anglican instinct for cathedral and church choirs. But both of these men are now dead and the gulf is getting wider. Perhaps you would agree, perhaps you would disagree. Neither, though, would have been inspired or even known about, unfortunately, um, the desire uh, uh, to write functional music for the non-specialist worshipper in the pew. Something to consider. Bernard Huybers was the foremost forerunner in the new ideas for congregational music in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, and he made the case that the new active participation should require a new kind of liturgical music and a new kind of liturgical composer. He advised that the church's historical repertoire of sacred art music and its associated performance traditions should be abandoned. The Scottish musician and musicologist Michael Ferguson writes, in an ideological sense too, he, Huybers, uh, regards sacred art music as no longer having a legitimate place. And Huybers refers to art musicians and the sacred traditions of the church as a kind of musical colonialism. It's odd to see that a Catholic culture warrior of the 1960s could be so prophetic of the widespread chaos created by today's culture warriors in the secular world who use similar language about our entire cultural history. One could argue that this radical stance has gained much purchase in the church of today and is the cause, perhaps, one might argue, of many musicians turning away from liturgical concerns and for the many clergy and liturgists who regard serious musicians as surplus to contemporary requirements, unnecessary and unwanted. Generally, it has caused bewilderment among musicians outside the church who see the willful abandonment of tradition and practice as a kind of iconoclasm associated more with the Protestant reformations of past centuries or the kind of communist culture wars instigated in 1960s China, 1970s Cambodia, or in the student unions of American and British college campuses of the present day. Nevertheless, there are pockets of insight where other alternative and far less destructive understandings of Catholic liturgical development still hold sway. 
On the one hand, of course, it is still possible to compose choral music for skillful choirs and organists in the church, usually in big cities. And in the United Kingdom, it's big cities like London and Liverpool and in establishments where money is available for the maintenance of professional standards. And there are enough people still around in the Catholic Church who hold a much more nuanced understanding of how congregational song might be. There have certainly been competing ideas as to how music in the liturgy might develop and grow these last 50 years. On one hand, there has been Pope Benedict the 16th and others who hold that church tradition can indeed provide effective models which can give good orientation for composers in the modern age and that post-conciliar liturgical music can be of pastoral impact in the vernacular but can simultaneously draw deeply from the wells of Catholic heritage and sound. And then there is Edward Schaefer, the American academic and musician who optimistically sees the modern situation as, quote, ripe for improvement, suggesting that the various historical and ideological trends can be rebalanced. He sees an ongoing role in this for Gregorian chant. I've certainly been aware of these different, uh, sometimes opposing forces, sometimes pulling the church in opposing directions. I can see potency and persuasiveness in many of the strong and sometimes vehemently opposed arguments. Over the years, I've attempted to compose congregational music myself, including three mass settings and various responsorial psalms based on the time when I organised music in a poor parish in Glasgow. I will talk a little bit about these experiences, if I may, and try to explain why I've come, I've come to the belated conclusion that I am no longer able to write aesthetically satisfying congregational music according to the templates that have emerged in the Catholic Anglosphere in recent decades. But, as I indicated earlier, I also write choral music specifically for the liturgy, and I have no intention of abandoning that. The most pertinent body of this work is a collection of so-called Strathclyde motets, uh, published in two volumes, written for Alan Tavener's chamber choir at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Most were written for them to sing at the Catholic chaplaincy of that university and at the sister parish of St. Columbus in Mary Hill, Glasgow, which were both served by the Dominicans until 2017. I'll come back to them in a minute. There was something in the high modernism of the late 20th century art music which favoured instrumental music over choral or even vocal music. The virtuosity and complexity so sought after by modernist composers could be attained more easily with instruments. In fact, a lot of the vocal music of 20th century frontline modernists is deeply instrumental in its conception mimicking the life and athletic twists and turns that could be achieved by instrumental specialists. Therefore, the instincts more associated with song and choir were downgraded and replaced by alternative creative priorities. This, I think, explains my temporary drifting away from choral music in my younger years at a time when I was more beguiled by the pushing of boundaries associated with major modernist composers from Schoenberg through to Boulez. There was also a time in the 1980s, uh, at this time a retinence on, on my part to show my hand as a religious composer, having been persuaded temporarily that religion had no place at the so-called cutting edge of modern artistic endeavour. In this, I was wrong. No doubt encouraged by the likes of Messiaen and later those deeply spiritual voices emerging from the shadows of Soviet state-enforced atheism, like um, Alfred Schnitke and Gubaidulina in Russia, Arvo Pert, of course, in Estonia, Goretsky, the great friend of 
Pope John Paul II from Poland, I turned back to my original instincts and slowly but surely began building a body of work for choral forces, much of which was shaped by my liturgical and theological experiences and outlook as a Catholic. Although it was not clear in the 1970s and 80s that imminently there would be a huge resurgence of interest in choral music, which would become such a prominent feature of musical life, especially in the, United, in the United Kingdom, but of course elsewhere, and indeed in the lives of many composers at the end of the century and into this one. I did not foresee the intense imaginative relationship that I would eventually build with the likes of Harry Christophers, for example, the conductor of the 16. And I did not foresee just how much the new brilliant British choral ensembles would feature in the work of the modern composer. The Sixteen, Tenebrae, Polyphony, the Talus Scholars, the Hilliard Ensemble, the King Singers, and Capella Nova. In fact, it would be for this last Scottish group that I would write my seven last words from the cross in 1993. Scored for choir and string ensemble, it's one of my most performed works, especially at Lent and Easter Tide. For a while, um, from about 2005, I became interested in what Edward Schaefer described as the rebalancing of trends in liturgical music practice in the Catholic Church. As I said earlier, Pope Benedict XVI took a great interest in the church's music, and I was struck by this quote from him speaking in the Sistine Chapel in 2006. He said, an authentic updating of sacred music can take place in the lineage of the great tradition of the past of Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony. This galvanized me to be involved in the John Henry Newman Institute of Liturgical Music and in the establishment of Musica Sacra Scotland, which organized two na national conferences to encourage the rejuvenation of Gregorian type chant in English and in Latin for ordinary people in the liturgy. It also affected my compositional work too, especially when I was writing choral music specifically for the Catholic Church. I wrote a number of works for Westminster Cathedral at this time, and also these Strathclyde motets, which I mentioned a little while ago, many of which are based on chant and devised with a view that ordinary church student and amateur choirs could perform them with relative ease. All these experiences were absorbed in my choral writing and provide the basis of a lot of my thinking, technique, aesthetics and aspirations for future work. So I'd, I'd like to look closely, if I may, at a couple of these Strathclyde motets. Uh, I said this about my Strathclyde motets in the liner notes for one of the CDs recorded by Capella Nova. I said, there's a kind of suspended animation about them. They don't seem to go anywhere. They kind of float as an entity. And there are one or two ideas that sort of ease into being and just exist, and then it stops. Uh, not, not the most encouraging self-analysis for a composer, and I could see uh, that many in the modernist world of music would wonder at what the value of, of, the, of that kind of music was. But I suppose this, these words describe a, a musical structure that is dependent on the text and not on any abstract musical device or parameter. And any authentic reading of the impact of liturgical music needs to stress the primacy of scriptural focus above everything else. These motets are invariably slow, largely homophonic, and sometimes plain song derived with ornamental passages. The suspended animation hinted at in that quote points to the persu persuasive timelessness in Catholic liturgy that every daytime is left outside and a new time, God's time, heaven's time, reaches down into our space and we become one with it. This can bring about an introspective quality to music which responds to these requirements. 
Also, most of those, these motets are communion propers, which respond to the moment in the Mass where the wor worshipper confronts his or her most personal reflections in the most sacred, at the most sacred and most numinous moment of the liturgy, at the reception of Holy Communion. Although most of these motets were written for a fairly competent university chamber choir, there are two which were written specifically for my choir of amateur volunteers in St. Columbus. And I could maybe, with as much charity as I could muster, uh, describe uh, what these singers were like. Many of them had never sung before. Many of them had never sung in choirs before. Most of them did not read music. So a lot of note bashing was required uh, for, in the rehearsals and a lot of patience required, which sometimes I, I was able to devote to them. Um, but, uh, and they found some of this music tricky to begin with, but eventually they got on board with it and uh, um, were very enthused by it. In Splendoribus Sanctorum, um, which uh, uh, is one of these, uh, Let's see, it's a, it's a communion motet for Midnight Mass. The, the, the English translation is, amidst the splendors of the heavenly sanctuary, amidst the splendors of the heavenly sanctuary, from the womb, before the morning star, I have begotten you. Um, by necessity, because of the, the singers and, uh, and volunteers I was writing for, this is some of the most simple and most modest music in the collection. Some of the most simple music I've ever written. The plain song original is sung by the women. Uh, and I, I, I'll, I mean, I don't know if you can pick up this over Zoom, but I'll try and sh show you a little bit of the, the score. I don't know if, it's, if you can see that clearly, but basically this, the, the, uh, the plain song is given to the, the women of the, in the soprano and alto line. Um, it's sung over bass drones, and if you can see down there, the only note that the bassists sing is an F all the way through, doubled at the octave, so very, very simple. And the only other thing that happens in this piece is that uh, there's a kind of medieval full boredom effect where the tenor part simply follows the top line below in parallel fifths. There's nothing more simple than that. A plain song melody, Sung, uh, sung in, uh, with an open fifths and, and a drone. It's as simple as that. And uh, eventually, even my uh, volunteers at St. Columbus were able to sing this very, very well. But this motet also has a solo trumpet part, which interjects more animated flourishes at the end of each choral phrase. The trumpet music is very different from the choral music. Uh, written in four obligato passages, which are cued by the conductor ad libitum during the choral phrases. Again, if you turn the page, this is the trumpet music, very different from the choral music, it's much more virtuosic, and there's a reason for this, the simple and the virtuosic coming together, which I'll explain. Um, but there's a degree of freedom in the way that the trumpeter can play this music, very free, no bar lines, he doesn't need to follow the conductor apart from get his cues to come in. Um, the the, the programme note says, says, these four obligato passages are cued by the conductor during the first singing of the motet. During subsequent repetitions, the trumpeter may vary the obligato passages by jumping from line to line or from phrase to phrase ad lib. So a little bit of um, aleatoricism there, I suppose you could say. Why? Well, I was keen to bring in some uh, brilliant student musicians to sing or play at mass with my choir. I simply asked one of the conservatory trumpeters to come along and play at the midnight mass at Christmas. It allowed my choir, who were very inexperienced, to sing something simple while contributing to quite a complex and substantial musical structure alongside a virtuoso player in two different levels of music which mesh together. And I think the effect is of a very strange and repetitive mantra, because the choral music simply repeats over and over again to suit the necessary reflection and mystery appropriate for communion at midnight mass. Now, at this point, Frank is going to uh, try to play uh, it's a YouTube clip 
of this piece. It's, it's quite tricky to get the technology to work. And a little warning in advance that there's an advert at the beginning of each of these clips, uh, which hopefully won't be too embarrassing. All right, so over to me. Um, I'm going to see if this works as it did during our rehearsal. And if it doesn't, Mark, I'm going to rely on you to jump in and tell me what I might do. Okay, share some distract icon tips. Hold on, I have to mute myself first. I think that's all we need to try and work for that. Good, thank you. That came across loud in here. It certainly came, ac came across the Atlantic to the west of Scotland anyway. So I hope- Excellent, good. thank you. Good, thank you, Frank. Frank, what I think I'll do is, uh, I may just have use one more example of this traffic light motets and then uh, that, that Gloria, you know, that congregational Gloria later. Okay. Um, I'll talk about one more of these, um, Strathclyde Motets. It's uh, in English. It's called O Radiant Dawn. It was one of the Advent antiphons. It was written two years later. It's quite a traditional four-part setting of an English text for Advent. Its model is 16th and 17th century church music. And again, I wrote it for my little choir of <laughs> volunteers in Glasgow. In particular, it has an opening phrase which pays homage to O Nata Lux by Thomas Tallis. One of the great lessons from the Reformation was the desire to communicate text more clearly and audibly in choral song. The principal aspiration here in this little piece was for the words to be heard and to be understood. Hence, the strongly homophonic approach in the setting. There are some melismas, but they are not very long. At the most, three or four notes per syllable. A melisma is the use of... Um, two or three notes, or sometimes more, uh, per syllable. It, it stretches the syllable that little bit more, and some say uh, ma uh, it makes it mo sometimes more difficult to keep a latch on to what the words are that are being sung. So here, the melismas are not very long. At the most, three or four notes per syllable, and um, um, 
However, in this setting, most of the syllables just have one note. It's, uh, as I say, it's, a, it's a, a, an Advent piece, O Radiant Dawn, Splendor of Eternal Light, Son of Justice, come shine in those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. You could hear a little bit of this, and just while we're, we're waiting, uh, while Frank is setting that up, maybe just show you what the score looks like. Uh, if you can see that, even at this distance, it's uh, very simple, uh, two staves, uh, very part, parts move in unison, rhythmic unison, etc. That's fine, Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before opening the conversation up to everyone, I think it'd probably be best if I say a little bit about congregational music, because I did flag it up as an important consideration right at the start. Um, I, I think it's, it's, to, it's the question of congregational music that has caused such uh, bickering and argument within the church in recent times. Maybe it was, it was always the case throughout history that uh, um, the question of how ordinary people sing their prayers uh, would um, uh, come to the fore in much discussion uh, with liturgists and theologians and, uh, and clergy and musicians. And it's certainly the case, as you're probably aware, in the United States and, and many other places that there's an ongoing discussion uh, about, about this matter. I, I don't really want to get involved in the, 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 the parameters of that argument, but maybe just to sort of set things going, I could maybe tell you a little story about a congregational mass that I was asked to write for the papal visit here in the United Kingdom in 2010. Uh, Benedict XVI came to the United Kingdom and there were very public masses, uh, very large scale uh, open air masses in Glasgow and in Birmingham. In fact, the Birmingham Mass at Cofton Park was where the beatification of John Henry Newman took place. So the bishops of Scotland and England and Wales, they're not usually, they don't usually collaborate together, uh, but they got together uh, and asked me uh, to write a, a new congregational mass for these events, uh, which I was very happy about. However, uh, the, the announcement of the papal visit came in May of that year, and, um, and he arrived here in, in September. So in May, I was asked to write a congregational mass, um, which was going to be used throughout the whole country and had not just to be written quickly, but had to be disseminated through not just the choirs of the whole of the United Kingdom, but into the parishes. Because if this was a congregational mass, it should be known by the, the community at large. In retrospect, that was a, an impossible brief. Um, and in many ways, uh, the sh I, I shouldn't really have accepted the commission. There was no way that thousands of people were going to learn brand new music in a matter of weeks uh, for something like a papal mass. However, uh, we did it anyway, and we got the, the music. I, I wrote it very quickly. I got the music around the 
parishes, the diocese, uh, the choirs themselves learned it very quickly. And you know, as you know, um, any new music for congregation um, takes a long while to bed in and a long while to be taught. And on first encounter, the only people that are really going to be able to uh, participate in that music are the people in the pew who can actually read the music. And that was the case at these uh, very public masses. And uh, we've got a, a, a YouTube clip here of the Gloria being sung at Cofton Park. And you'll see that the choirs sing wonderfully. I think there's about 800 of them in this choir. Uh, and sometimes the, the camera pans around others, and some of the congregation are singing, but, uh, the ones that have, are reading the booklets, others are, uh, in true Catholic fashion, completely silent. Some of the clergy are singing, some of them are not. Uh, I don't think the Pope's singing, but uh, I think we'll give her an excuse. But anyway, I, 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 I just want to play a little bit of this and to raise uh, the matter of this um, because it, it's, it, these, these, these issues can are, never seem to be discussed um, calmly. Uh, there always seems to be an element of chaos and uh, disputation about these matters. And maybe that's the way it's always to be for a long while to come. But maybe um, but by, by talking about it and certainly looking at this excerpt, we could get a conversation going. The whole question of what aesthetic, what style, uh, is best for Catholic congregations in the Anglosphere to use uh, are other questions, of course, as well. Um, and I'm sure you, you're aware of many of those arguments. Anyway, here is the Gloria uh, from my uh, Mass in honour of uh, that, that time, blessed John Henry Newman. Glory to God in the high. Okay, uh, some nice memories there for me, uh, going back to the papal visit. Um, but as I expected, um, there, there has been limited take up of the mass. Uh, the, that mass is used in parishes um, in the United Kingdom, for example, where, where there is a, a dedicated music staff, a, a skilled organist, a skilled cantor, skilled music director. Um, the, it's, it's, it's more difficult to be used in parishes where um, that, that isn't the case, and uh, that, that, that was the big dilemma. Could I write a mass that, that embraced, in a sense, every parish situation, uh, or should I just gear it towards something in particular? And it's a dilemma that maybe we all face. Um, uh, certainly, 
there are many parishes in the United Kingdom and in Ireland which are quite poor and uh, have no music provision at all or hardly anything. And therefore a mass like that would be very difficult uh, to implement as part of the uh, liturgical pro uh, program. Um, nevertheless, it's there, it's another addition to these many uh, congregational masses that are written for the church. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in to the mix because I'm sure that uh, in a very wide ranging um, uh, array of thoughts and discussion points, sacred music, liturgical music, uh, the Catholic Anglosphere, etc., it, it's, it's another point for reflection. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening to my presentation. I look forward to our conversation <laughs> now. Well, thank you very much, Sir James. Um, the range of your experience um, from you know, BBC proms down to uh, St. Columbus in, in Glasgow uh, really lends a lot of uh, authority to uh, the things you're discussing with us. Um, Frank, yes. could I interrupt because it's, I forgot to introduce the brief bios of the panelists. So if you'll forgive me, maybe I oh, will step in no, and do that own. and then we Please. can continue the conversation. I didn't really want to interrupt the flow. And as I said, we'll be emailing you uh, the longer bios and places where you can listen to their music. So in no particular order, Daniel J. Nags is an award-winning composer of sacred music. Among his many projects, his striking Ave Maria project, uh, which will continue for 50 years, he is committed to composing a new Ave Maria until the year 2054. Mark Nowakowski is a composer, the son of Polish immigrants and a professor of music at Kent State University. Zanti Kraft is a sacred music composer from Spokane, specializing in vocal and string writing. She was the artist in resident at St. Gertrude's, Gertrude's Monastery in 2019. Joseph Stilwell is an award-winning composer on the faculty of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Robert Chastain, also known as Bobby Chastain, is a Bay Area Roman Catholic composer who's also the founder of the San Francisco Surround Sound Orchestra and the San Francisco Wind Symphony. Thomas Octave is a composer and the Chair of Fine Arts and Associate Professor at St. Vincent College, as well as the Director of Sacred Music in the Diocese of Greensburg. Dr. Enrico is a Brazilian and Canadian composer, or a Brazilian now located in Toronto, and music educators among his many compositions. He was commissioned to compose three pieces for the dedication of the Montreal Cathedral in Canada. Tate Pumphrey is a rising young composer also from Ontario, uh, Canada. Gonzalo, Gonzalo A. Ramos, is the artistic director of the Houston Cecilia Chamber Choir and several other ensembles, and also the director of music for the Hispanic Liturgy at All Saints Catholic Church in Houston, Texas. Simon Berry is the director of music and liturgy at St. Dominic's Church, which is the center of much sacred music in San Francisco, the Archdiocese of San Francisco. And composer Nicholas Lemmy is a professor of Gregorian chant, sacred polyphony, and voice at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Denton, Nebraska. Welcome and thank you. Um, Jeffrey Quick. Oh, I, I'm, Je I'm so sorry. Jeffrey Quick is, got cut from my list, but Frank, do you want to give the short intro for Jeffrey? I know he composes music for the Benedict 16 uh, at your request. So apologies, Jeff. <clears throat> well, uh, you got your degree from the Cleveland Conservatory. Can you unmute yourself? Myself here. No, I, I, I got my undergraduate degree from uh, uh, University of Michigan and my uh, master's from uh, Cleveland State University, Cleveland not State a more State. prestigious music school in Cleveland, yeah, but yeah. I still got a good, uh, good education there. Um, I am a uh, music director for the uh, Latin Mass at St. Sebastian in Akron and uh, have just begun being music director again after spending most of a year as cantor. 
since I wasn't allowed to have anybody else up in the loft. And a recently retired music librarian. Yep. <laughs> and a farmer. And a well, sort of. Well, okay. no, I mean, to me, you're a real farmer. Okay, well, when you're in a city, everybody out here looks like a real farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, um, so I see that um, Simon has uh, his hand raised, and why don't we move over to see what his question is for Sir James or his comment? Thank you very much, Frank. and. Uh... Sir James, Jimmy, we can we share much, including nationhood and birthdays, the year as well as the date. Um, at St Dominic's, we've done a lot of your music, including all but one of the two sets of the Strathclyde motets, the two mass settings, the uh, John Henry Newman and St Anne, and a new song, and much other stuff. So, a comment about the congregational music: the children in our family mass choir love the Gloria from the James Henry Newman Mass. The adults in the congregation don't love it. And it's worth persevering. In fact, we're singing it tomorrow. But it's interesting how the divide between new ideas and new rhythms um, is, is completely aligned to age group, what they're used to. The children just love it. I came across the Strathclyde Motets, and first of all, in Splendor of the Sanctorum, the first one, and because of its chant connection, I began to love it because you know, the Jerusalem Requiem is my first love in music, and now your music is. And we went on to commission um, one of the panelists, where is Joe, to write a similar motet for Easter, um, Terra Tremuet, which I hope he will introduce later on. It's very, it's got some similar ideas, it goes a little bit further, but we now want to um, commission you to write us a motet or a mass setting for our parish's 150th anniversary. So I've got you online. I'll write to you later on. Um, Alan White, Father Alan White is on our side. You know him as well as we know him. Um, but I would encourage you all to look at this wonderful stuff. This, this music is transcendental. More than any other composer I've come across recently and we're terribly grateful for it. Um, so it is, a lot of it's being sung on the West Coast, but in small pockets. Thank you for listening. Thank you. It's great to meet you, Simon. I'm glad to hear that. It's a small world. Uh, I wrote music for Alan White's ordination when I was an undergraduate. That's good. Ah, yeah. He's a great man. Yeah. This, this question of the generational divide is really a, a quite a salient one. It's also reflected, it seems to be, in the receptivity um, to Gregorian chant being sung at mass. Children seem to take to it. I know the Benedict the 16th Institute um, has sponsored chant camps for children um, in Benicia at the, um, at uh, forget what the Dominican church is in Benicia, sorry. What, what is it? Well. It's St. Dominic's in Benicia. Uh, in yeah. Benicia, St. Dominic's in Benicia. And it's been a huge success with, you know, 40, 50 kids. Um, I don't know that there's more to be said about it than that. The reasons for it are, yes, they're, they have something to do with age. I think they have something to do with um, commitments to a cultural worldview among, unfortunately, people of my generation um, that um, that these young people don't share and are therefore much more open-minded uh, when it comes to the reception of things unfamiliar to them. I'm wondering if uh, Mark, if you, thank you, Simon and Frank, if, if uh, you have any reactions perhaps or questions or comments about mm -hmm. Sir James's um, talk today. Well, thank you. And thank you, Maggie and Frank and Archbishop for organizing this. You know, there's been so many great Benedict XVI events uh, that have taken place uh, due to tragic times like this pandemic. So you, you've brought some great things out of this. And today's a real highlight. And thank you, Sir James, for being with us. Um, you started with the first Strathclyde motet. And, and, I, and I wanted to share with you something that hit me the first time I heard it. 
Uh, and um, before I say that, um, you know, we, we talk a lot, even amongst ourselves, a lot of the panelists who know each other now, um, about what is the purpose of what we are doing. Uh, and, and in great art, I think, is, is not reactive, is not political, uh, but it's sort of creating something uh, that is on the bleeding edge of the spiritual reality or needs of our times. Uh, and in a time of crisis like our own, I, I think this has becomes a very pertinent question for, for artists in general, especially Catholic artists, what should we be doing? Uh, and so uh, you, you might be familiar, I'm sure the panel is in many of the audience uh, with Charles Ives is the unanswered question, right? And, and has that uh, keening and insistent trumpet line, which the piece fades into nothingness and leaves an open-ended question, which seems to have uh, haunted modern music as he was an emerging modernist and ha haunted Americans in general to the point where, uh, uh, I don't know, it would be a little under a century later, Bernstein wrote a book of the same uh, question. And so when I heard Sir James's Strathclyde Motet, the first one that we played, and, and the trumpet came, and I go, Oh, there's a response. I just, I heard trumpet to trumpet. Uh, and I thought, Well, the, the unanswered question from this, you know, Yankee transcendentalist to, uh, to, to Sir James as well. Perhaps the unanswered question is to be found uh, in the pursuit of beauty himself in the context of the liturgy. Uh, and that is certainly um, perhaps counterintuitively to many, that might be the, the bleeding leading edge of what's happening. And so uh, with crisis in the church, with, with crisis in society, uh, what Sir James do you think um, we should be doing. There, there's, and so people used to, you know, we'll have these conversations. Daniel Nags and I had this conversation recently. Is the world ending? Things are so crazy. Things seem so unstable. We're all waiting for the ground to shift under our feet. And yet, I think, no, it's not. And I have one evidence I can point to is that God seems to be calling lots of great artists in every discipline. And there's incredible work being done. Uh, uh, even, even, you know, without ecclesial support, without the support of our industries. Uh, uh, so what is your advice to, 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 to people who are pursuing this, who want to do something of meaning with their lives, despite every opposition in this field of ours? Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there's a kind of two-pronged approach I'd like to take to respond to. Uh, it's, again, it's because right from the outset, uh, we can sometimes, we're slightly unsure about who, what we're talking about and who we're talking about, who, who we're talking to. Are we talking to the church? Are we talking to our co-religionists about what we do as musicians and composers? Or are we talking to the outside world? I think we've got to talk to both. Um, and there is, there's reasons to be cheerful uh, in both uh, contexts. The first of all, um, I think I've hinted at it already, that within that world, where we share a love of music with people who don't share our faith, um, there is a far less vehement opposition to religion amongst people who love music. I don't know if you've noticed this. It's just almost as if they realize that we're onto something, that there is something there, that there is something profound and um, numerous, numinous about our art form. They certainly have great respect for its tradition, which is great. They understand where it has come from, and I suppose they understand where we're coming from in that sense as well. There's a respect for the Judeo-Christian heritage within that aspect of our culture. And, uh, and, and therefore we share a, a similar meeting ground where we come together as believers and non-believers to encounter something transcendental and indeed something beautiful. Uh, and it's, it's in that meeting place where music meets the rest of humanity that perhaps doors onto the infinite windows onto the divine will open and do open. As far as the church is concerned, uh, there's a very different kind of uh, responsibility uh, for those of us who write music for liturgy compared to music even for the concert hall. It's because it's not just, hopefully it is music that in some way entertains, but it's not just that. The responsibility lies in us to provide a music uh, even a specialist music, which is played by, uh, played and sung by professionals or, or great musicians, uh, but nevertheless, it's a music which has to carry the thoughts and prayers and devotions of ordinary people uh, to the altar of God. And that's a huge responsibility, and it's a very different kind of responsibility. Um, 
if, if responsibility is the right word for those of us who write concert music, to write music which enables a person to pray better, to write music which takes those prayers, carries them like incense uh, to the presence of God is, is something, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique commission, a unique um, vocation uh, for for the living artist, for the the, the 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 Christian composer, and it's something that we should rejoice in, uh, and it's it, it, it gives us a unique opportunity to bring beauty into the sphere of the church in a very specific way. So I, I think that's fascinating that you mentioned the uh, the incense uh, carrying you know the prayers of the faithful, um, which of course is is from the mass, because um, I, I believe it was Aidan Nichols. Um, who said that music in the liturgy takes on the role of a sacramental, very much like the incense in the mass. That is, it, it prepares the faithful to receive grace, uh, has to dispose them to cooperate with any uh, graces on offer. And it does this by <clears throat> the music fusing itself to the logos, to the word. And it has to be in this, this intimate and filial kind of relationship, not drawing undue attention to itself, um, which might thereby distract from the primacy of the word. And so um, I believe that composers creating music that they know is going to be, it has been either commissioned for or they know is going to be um, presented principally in liturgical celebrations, um, they, they have to internalize um, a discipline, I might even say a, a, a restraint that's um, quite different from the kind of freedoms that we composers have when composing for the um, concert stage. May I, um, if you'll forgive me, Zanti, I want to pull you in and hear your thoughts or questions, uh, particularly as a young composer, negotiating the sometimes apparently hostile musical culture in America and your aspirations. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to say to um, James to thank you for being Catholic, for pursuing your call to holiness, because it's so clear in your music that you are formed from the liturgy, um, not only in the musical ex excerpts from chant that you use, but, but just in the, in the way that your intuition has been formed by being part of the mystical body of Christ in the church and receiving Christ, you know, week by week and, and more as a Dominican, thank you. Um, it is so, Teaching in K through four music, um, it is also so clear how readily children accept Gregorian chant. They love it. You can teach four to eight year olds the solemn tone, Salve Regina, um, and they understand the sim symbolism in it. Um, so my kind of focus as a composer has always been very practical. I've written things just because in my limited knowledge, I didn't know of other kind of simple but very reverent things that, that could be done and could be used. Um, and so um, with, with, with children and, and with congregations, I think um, my work is, is focused on how to revitalize music in liturgies and school liturgies where children are formed and exposed to the liturgies. And these are often the ones that are thrown away completely because you schools don't prioritize or can't afford to have a music director for those school liturgies. Um, but how do we take the beauty uh, that we've been given through our tradition, our vast and, and glorious tradition, and distill it into um, the form, forms that can be, can be done by musically trained amateurs in the parish and school setting? Um, that's kind of my question with, with you, because you've worked with amateurs and you've worked with um, in a, you know, I mean, amateur in the best sense of the word, lover of lovers of music, and you worked with professionals, and it is so crucially important that you're pursuing this Gesamtkunstwerk, all in of of 
of your choral music. And it's also so important that you've done things that have been accessible. And so that's really, that's been the insight for me from this has, has been the, the marriage between the virtuosic, um, you know, trumpet and the amateur choir. And so how have you navigated bringing, bringing beauty and, and the importance of forming um, the youth in, in this tradition? Well, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot to consider there. Um, I think there might be something about the, the experience of the British composer over the decades and indeed century now um, that might even go beyond the, the experience of the church and churches. Because if you think about composers that uh, I've, I've always admired from, from this part of the country, and, and this isn't to say that it doesn't happen elsewhere, but there is certainly something uh, notable about the British experience of composition where composers have been dedicated to their communities one way or another. Um, regardless of style and aesthetic and ideology, many of these composers, and I'll cite some in a minute, have, have seen their role in community, in their communities as very important. And it goes right back to the likes of Vaughan Williams and Elgar and Holst, who worked with amateurs, who worked with uh, adults and children singing in choirs, who worked with local brass bands and, and choral societies, and saw that part of their work as just as important as anything else. And indeed, the ecology, musical ecology of a country like Britain is that the, 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 the deep and wide reservoir of amateur music making feeds into or feeds up to uh, the professional life as well and uh, from the likes of Von Williams you can trace it through to the likes of Benjamin Britten who who's, some of whose greatest music was written for children such as his uh, church operas, Neuer's Flood and so on and he established a music festival in Aldborough, um, which was meant to be of use to the local community. And he wanted the local community to be performers and participants in that, he would write for them. And it seems to be that there are many, Michael Tippett's another one, who worked with workers' educational associations and uh, um, school children. Peter Maxwell Davis, who I mentioned, established a festival, similar festival of music in the Orkney Islands. And uh, I used to trek up there as an undergraduate and I was amazed to see the local people coming to these wonderful concerts. And you'd get performers in from all over the country and from the world to perform in local church halls and town halls, village halls. And perhaps that localism is, is part of the fabric of our musical life as well. But I, I feel encouraged that these composers, and I simply cite the ones from my own country, and I'm sure there are others in America and elsewhere, who did see their commitment to the, the, their, their social um, milieu as being absolutely important, and it fed into their music making, and they, they themselves were able to encourage amateurs and children to be fully involved in a whole range of, some might say, quite esoteric activity from the per performance of uh, modern music to indeed the singing of Gregorian chant. And I, I absolutely take on board what's already been said about young people and their, their love of chant, because they don't suffer from uh, their elders' um, anxieties about the culture wars that uh, uh, that's st still going on in the background of our minds uh, about um, where the church is, where it has been, where it's going, and a lot of sometimes extraneous and sometimes irrelevant cultural matters feed into that anxiety about music as well. And it's just wonderful that children have that openness of spirit to something as beautiful and indeed as something as ancient as, and traditional as Gregorian chant. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I would just like to mention that um, Sir James is among those who has given back, shall we say, uh, to, the, to the local community, the establishment that you and you together with your wife, Lynn, the Cumnock, oh, he's Cumnock, I don't know how to pronounce the second word, I would say Trist, but. There, there is no wrong way to pronounce that word. Some people say <laughs> Trist. Some people say Trist. Trist, Trist, 
Yeah. Well, well, anyway, so but you you yourself have established uh, a music festival in your childhood hometown, haven't you? Yes, exactly. And uh, I mean, I took my lead, I think, for that from the likes of Benjamin Britten and um, Peter Maxwell Davis, who had done similar things in their lives. And in, in a sense, Aldborough and the St Magnus Festival have become models for me. And we formed a festival chorus amongst the local people. Uh, we work closely in schools, primary and secondary, uh, in the encouragement of composition, encouragement of young people creating their own music. Uh, because it's quite a traditional community, the churches are still quite strong in that uh, little part of Ayrshire. And the churches have been, uh, the church, the various different denominational parishes have been great supporters. They've, we will, they've allowed us to put on concerts there. The 16 gave the very first uh, concert uh, wow. in the Catholic church where I was baptized and made my first communion and played the organ as a teenager. Uh, it was absolutely packed. I mean, none of the churches, you, you, can't get, you can't get any more than 300 or 400 into these places. Um, but um, no, we have the likes of the Westminster Cathedral Choir came one year. And um, uh, so, I mean, it, it's okay. not just, it's a great, I feel that I want to give a gift back to the community, uh, but to, uh, to encourage them to be actively involved, especially the young ones, to make music with us, to write music for us. Um, um, it, it, it's, it's a vocation, it's part of the musical vocation, I think. I see a couple of hands raised, uh, Maggie. Do you want to go um, ahead and call on them, Joe? I, I don't know. Oh, that. Sorry, I what? technically don't know. I don't technically know. No, just, know just, tell, just tell them that you'd like oh, to call on someone. Enric, uh, you had your hand up first. Would you like to um, ask Sir James a question or a comment? Yeah, thanks. First for the masterclass, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I see in your music that you deal with form, musical form very carefully, which is fascinating. I think of, for example, your 2009 violin concerto, uh, where you have a more rhythmic uh, theme A and then a more lyrical theme B and kind of a tonic dominant-ish uh, uh, answer. Uh, so when you come to sacred music, we know that in Sao Pius the Tenth, Tyler Solicitudinis, it talks about sacred music and sanctity and goodness of form. So I wonder, how do you deal with form when you're composing liturgical music? To what extent do, uh, does the text lead the form? To what extent do classical forms enter the music? How do you deal with that? Yes, I've always been puzzled by that uh, uh, phrase uh, that uh, the Pope used. Um, no, it's not his fault, it's my fault. I don't fully understand what sometimes what he meant by it, the, the beauty of form and so on, the importance of form. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted that you notice my commitment to structural uh, elements in my music. The making of music has to have a, a, a structural backbone. It's not just the, the melodies and the harmonies and the, the, the textures. They can be the most wonderful melodies, harmonies and textures you can create, but if it's not held together by something strong, like a structural skeleton of sorts, or even a template, all the best ideas in the world will, uh, will collapse like a blancmange. Uh, and have a formlessness that will not communicate any of its beauty or seriousness or power. So structure is important. But I think I in indicated right at the beginning of this lecture that there is something different about writing liturgical music. And of course, when one sets text, uh, text, the text, in a sense, provides its own form to the composer. Um, perhaps the, the, the approach to sonata form and other, other traditional forms, that, that approach is still there in the background of one's mind in the kind of subliminal thoughts that one brings to it. But the text is, is a, definitely a determining factor on how the music flows and how it sits and how it um, coheres. More so perhaps in, in liturgical music, uh, it's already been mentioned a few times that the importance of, 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 of the word getting the word over 
It's, it's obsessed the church and its composers throughout the centuries. Uh, there have been reformations uh, around these, these questions. How do we communicate the beauty of, of scripture through music, through the musical setting of these texts? And perhaps, maybe, I, maybe I, I, uh, it was remiss of me, but I, I think it, it's almost a kind of subliminal or subconscious thing. A composer approaches these sacred texts and in my case, I think just allows them to breathe into existence, to breathe into the music, almost in an unconscious way. That's not to denigrate the importance of um, uh, structural designs and the, uh, the, the intellectual aspect of composing, but sometimes perhaps the intellectual uh, depth of music has to take second place. It has to step into the background and allow something much more indecipherable uh, to take its place as, as the, in, the, in, the fo in the forefront of, of the work. And that is the text, but that is the, the message of God itself. And I think, uh, I'm, I don't think I'm ducking the answer by saying that one has to be open to the, the message of God uh, when one writes music for the liturgy. Thank you, Sir James. Thank you. Thomas. Uh, you have a question or comment? Yes. Thank you, Sir James, so much for uh, this time today and for, for everything you brought to us. Uh, we in Pittsburgh have enjoyed your collaborations with Manfred Honig and, and, and the Pittsburgh Symphony, so thank you very much. Um, as a person who trains young musicians a lot of times, what do you think, uh, a twofold question, Sir James, um, what do you think are important things for young musicians to be learning as they prepare for careers in sacred music? And what is your hope uh, for sacred music as we go forward uh, in, in, in the current um, time period we're living in? Yes, um, well, I, I would hope that uh, those preparing to dedicate their lives to music and the liturgy would, would see it as a priority to uh, embrace the tradition, at least in the knowledge of what that tradition has given us. To, to have, have, have a, a, some kind of practical engagement with some of the things I've been talking about. Uh, Gregorian chant, polyphony, of course, that, that have been held as, that have been held up to high esteem uh, in much that has been said uh, by popes in, in recent decades. Um, and, and I think that should prevail. It's not to say that it's the, the only um, thing they should inform themselves about and they should be open to many, many things. They should be open to a, a, at least understanding of, of trends in modernism, even if it's to the extent of rejecting them. Uh, some, some modernist trends will work for the, for the Catholic liturgy, some will not. What is it about secular forms that can work and won't work? Um, We've got to investigate and interrogate uh, these questions continually. Um, are critics of secular forms in the liturgy right when they say that they don't sit well in the, in the sanctuary, in the temple, um, that there's something about the form of sacred music which uh, needs to avoid uh, strong rhythms, for example, um, and, and um, uh, evocations of the secular? Um, there have always been worries about these things, but maybe the, the anxieties are justified in some way. So there are many, many things that's a practical engagement that for young people, and I think they should, they should all, all learn to compose, uh, regardless of where they, they, they go with that. But maybe some deep historical thinking and indeed comparative uh, sociological study of, of music in the world, as it impinges on the experience of the church, will also be worth their investigations. Uh, Jeffrey, you, you have a question? Uh, yes, yes. If you see music as being, say, um, Apollonian or Dionysian, um, dramatic or less dramatic, and your music, I think, is more on the dramatic side than not, but I'm thinking in terms of your choral writing as a whole. And the question is, how does this interrelate 
to liturgical music specifically, because I tend to be, gravitate towards drama. And there is, of course, has been a big movement throughout church history to counter that. And so I'm always kind of second guessing what I'm doing when it's like, okay, is that too much? Is that? So what I'm asking you is, do you see a difference personally in your liturgical style versus your concert style in content? I mean, I'm, you know, certainly there would be differences in technical means, but in terms of how you respond to words or rhythms, do you see the liturgical style being different? I think my immediate answer is yes, I probably do. And I just think about, uh, reflect on your point about uh, drama in music and the, again, anxieties in the church about allowing operatic forms uh, and the sound of opera to percolate into the liturgy. There have been anxieties about that uh, through the 19th century. And in fact, you could say that the, the whole liturgical movement from the beginning of the 20th century was a, a desire to some might say cleanse the church of its operatic and dramatic instincts. Um, operatic trends, of course, had been seeping into the church's liturgy from the time of Mozart and maybe even before that. Um, but obviously there had been anxieties raised by the end of the century when a lot of the Italian uh, 19th century opera was quite clearly beginning also to infiltrate into the liturgy. And maybe there's, there, there's a uh, a good reason for those anxieties. So I, I'm aware of that. And, and, and now that you mention it, you know, if I write a passion setting, I've written two, and they're not liturgical pieces of music. They're written for concert halls and, uh, um, or, or sometimes they're performed in churches as concerts. And I, I, I hold my hand up and uh, admit to uh, the, the fact that there's a lot of dramatic and theatrical indeed operatic elements at work, especially in my St. John Passion. And um, if you want to tell the story of the St. John Passion, you can't really tackle that incredible courtroom drama uh, between Christ and Pilate without some recourse to the dramatic instinct. But would that sit well in a, a modern liturgy? No, it wouldn't. And it wasn't written for liturgy. It's not to say though that um, there's something of the dramatic um, and sometimes even the cosmic that can, can, uh, in a, that can enter into liturgical music in a dramatic way. And I'm certainly open to that. And uh, so sometimes there is great drama um, of its own type in liturgical music that is used well liturgically. But I also am aware that uh, the, the anxieties of which I spoke earlier are, are valid and perhaps should always be on the horizon of our thoughts. Thank you, Sir James. I want to make sure that we get all of our yeah, I'm composers gonna, I'm a chance to speak. Yeah. Uh, yes. So <clears> I'm just <throat> also warning all of you composers that you can speak briefly, but we would certainly I'm, like to hear from you all. And also- I'm gonna go alphabetically. For, well, so, I, okay. If you would so, like to go ahead, I'll let Bobby. you do it. So, so you, um, your own uh, body of work, um, you said, uh, I, I believe you've mentioned increasingly is focused around the liturgy of uh, Roman Catholic Church, but of course you have a considerable amount of um, concert conceived music also in your, um, um, in your catalog. What, what's your own reaction to this concert versus liturgical, um, well, I don't want to say it's an, an opposition, but you know, this polarity um, between the two, uh, you can either speak from your own experience or pose a question, it's, it's up to you. Oh, well, thank you, actually, this is, this is kind of right up my alley. And so, Sir James, thank you very much for what you, for bringing that up. Because um, it actually was a polarity with me for a while, which is probably damaging to myself both creatively and spiritually. Fascinating. Um, 
I think I passed up probably too many opportunities to do something just very simply liturgical, um, partially because it wasn't allowing me to stretch myself in terms of like the technique for writing for instruments. Um, I, I've, I've always had a certain dedication to writing sacred music, um, but something like, so Sir James, the, something that you did was fantastic is you really did your time writing congregational psalms um, with responses. And um, that is something, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm curious, do you think you would be where you are today? I mean, I mean if, if, if it wasn't like, in fact, a grace that you received for the time that you put in, um, providing gifts that can be brought to the altar for the, you know, for and by the community. Well, I think uh, taking up what was said earlier about, in my case, the British composer wanted to serve his community. Well, my, my community was the church. Uh, my community was uh, the parishes that I've worked with within the church. And to be able to provide music, um, functional music, if you like, um, what's the uh, Gebrauchs music, which is the, the German word, uh, for people like that, um, who uh, are non-specialists uh, is my way, I suppose, as a Catholic composer of doing what the likes of Benjamin Britten did for other communities. And, and perhaps uh, because, because of my commitment to music in the community and, and a composer being useful in, in, in his community, it's always been at the forefront of my mind to make my music work in some way uh, for those people in the pew, for the people who might sing uh, a responsorial psalm or a, a, a moment or a movement from a, a mass. So for many years, it, it, was, uh, it was a vital part of my activity. I, I don't get the chance to do it now, and maybe I've, I've closed down a little bit of that, but it was absolutely vital in, in my uh, evolution of thought regarding music in society and indeed music in the church. Um, I think you're saying something, but you're muted. I have muted myself. I might, can you hear me? Sorry, no, I'm not muted. I'm video stopped. Um, well, Frank was going to go alphabetically. So, but I don't have the alphabetical list. How about Daniel Nags? Would you like to join the conversation? Sure, and Sir James, uh, again, such a pleasure. I did not want to miss this. And uh, so many times when I hear your music, it, it fills my heart with so much joy. And if I'm happening to be somewhere where they're singing or performing your music, I always, always look forward to it. And so just thank you so much. Uh, your gift it really, really inspires me a lot. And yes, Mark alluded to this. Many of us talk about your specific works, are very familiar with. One of the first pieces that Mark ever spoke to me with, uh, about was uh, In Splendoribus. That was one of his favorites, and I had uh, my favorites of the Strathclyde Motets. But anyway, just really, really enjoy. Um, every time you speak, I enjoy that as well. So just thank you so much for being here. I have a, a tiny question as a composer. Um, some of my students like to ask this question to me, uh, but I, I honestly love to hear um, this from the composer perspective. So, um, and, and you can share as much as you want or as little as you want. I wanna respect the mystery and the, you know, the magic behind what you do, but could you talk a little bit about, um, say you get a commission to write a piece um, and you're gonna sit down and write it. Could you talk a little bit about the process? What is it like? Do you start sketching? Do you start to, uh, you know, free write words? Are you, I think, what is the pro process? And again, as little or as much as you wanna share with it, but I'm always very curious about that. So. Well, I find that every new piece is very different and uh, that's the kind of terrifying thing about it because you're never quite sure what the process of composition will be uh, and you're not quite sure how it's going to begin. Uh, is it something that might just happen in passing? Sometimes it happens by accident when one is not sat at a desk or not sat at a piano, but perhaps out and about. Perhaps it can come in the middle of the night um, or when one is out for a walk. Um, sometimes these are revelatory moments, sudden mo moments, sometimes they're gradual things. Um, but uh, one, once the, or very soon after 
the ideas germinate, whether it's whether it's in what, setting words or it, or simply getting uh, instrumental lines going. Um, the, the structure has to kick in, and this goes back to uh, the, la the last one of the last conversations we had. It's almost imperative to me that these ideas hold their ground well and, 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 and hold up well, um, so that perhaps even from the, the first moments, the first days uh, of ideas coming to life, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a, in, a, already thinking about how to make them um, stand on their own two feet so that they don't collapse under their own weight. So I always uh, emphasize uh, with, with students and, and young composers that it's important to get the structure right. And there are different ways to do that. And some composers like um, uh, going from note to note, bar to bar in a piece of music. And that's a very um, organic way of writing. And, and sometimes I do that myself. Others, interestingly, like to make sketches. And sometimes it's just scribbling of words on a paper. Uh, of how the music might be. And I found that quite useful so that after a few ideas have arisen, I might make a graph, nothing too technical, nothing too scientific or mathematical, uh, but a graph on an A4 say, size page that I can look at and say, this possibly could be my piece. Uh, and it might be mapped out in time segments or um, uh, intensity moments. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so that I mean what, what that does is it allows the composer to step back and be objective about one's own ideas and that's very hard sometimes especially as you get older and there's no teacher um, guiding your your mind and heart and, and I, I find that any, any mechanism that allows me that little bit of distance from the subjectivity of creation uh, can 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 only be useful Thank you. Wonderful. Joseph um, still part well uh, alphabetically Nicholas. Oh, all right, Frank. Whatever. Can you unmute Nicholas? Um, yeah, I, I Nicholas, it's, nice to meet you. it's nice to meet you in person. Thank you. Yes, you as well. And thank you again, Sir James McMillan, for uh, providing us this opportunity. This is quite an honor. Uh, I had uh, maybe more. I'm very glad. Daniel asked that question because I want to know that of every composer on this panel, actually, too. <laughs> As I, I learn a lot from uh, hearing about other people's processes. Um, my question to you, uh, as a very seasoned composer um, uh, who has cut your teeth on uh, quite, a, uh, quite a few different kinds of music and, and scenarios, um, is more of a mentor question, I guess. Uh, I, 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 when I came to writing music, I came to writing music uh, not for the church. I didn't know that people wrote music for church that I liked um, until I got older uh, and went to college. But even then, I didn't know that people were still doing that were living. Um, uh, and so my question is, uh, for maybe someone who is, uh, and other people may have the same kind of question in a different way. But for those who have um, stepped into church music after being composers in other genres um, and st stepped into church music and found that there's really not a, in, uh, it's difficult to get your work performed in, in outside your immediate circles and uh, by, um, by others and how, how one would maybe go about that uh, or how you found yourself being adopted into those, those settings. I guess I, I, I write for my students and I write for my own choir. Um, uh, but before that, I found myself doing other things that were a little bit more ex uh, extensive. I, I don't know, it just seemed to be more opportunities. And now the liturgy can never be exhausted with its opportunities for writing new things, but at the same time, uh, finding choirs that are willing to uh, experiment a little bit with something that you want to uh, try out, um, and then having them do it at a level where you're going to be able to learn from it. Uh, I, I wonder if you had any insights on, 
on that? Yes, um, I think it's important in the early stage of, of a, uh, a composer's life uh, to get your peers on side uh, to have your fellow musicians be the first advocates of your music so that the people you study with or work with uh, become your first performers. And, and that sharing of music with your nearest and dearest or the people that, that work with you or play with you or make music with you is very important. It certainly was important for me um, right from my time at uh, high school, you know, trying things out with the choir at school, uh, asking the teacher permission to do that, and then trying to get Trying, trying to alert people outside your immediate milieu. And that can be hard, of course. Um, but usually uh, uh, through music colleges, that you, you, the, there tends to be connections within connections and, and musicians can be sometimes persuaded uh, to take on a new piece or a project, uh, even just to let you hear, hear it being played. <clears throat> within the world of liturgy, it does come, I think, down to a lot of the time to your own uh, uh, parish or uh, your own diocese, uh, trying out things for people in the area. But I am aware of um, national and sometimes international movements. Uh, and maybe, maybe there are some people in the panel today who know more about this in the United States um, of organizations in North America, uh, which uh, do take up new choral music, uh, simple music for choirs, simple music for congregations. And it's finding how those networks operate uh, that might be the way forward uh, to get uh, some, some of your, uh, the work out there. Uh, I've, I've certainly been aware of that happening in, in very different ways. Some networks, online networks or through uh, networks of uh, friend, friends, friend, musician friends, priest friends, clergy friends, parish friends that might be able to get the music around. But never give up, keep, keep trying to share with it, share your uh, choral music and, and so on and congregational mu music with as many people that uh, are open to it as possible. Thank you. I'll just add to that, that, um, and I know you've, 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 you've done this in the past, uh, symposia like the one at CMAA is, mm -hmm is a really good forum for connecting with people. I know that um, going, you know, I, I returned to the Catholic church in 2009. Um, so I'm, I'm still a relatively young Catholic uh, as an adult and was wondering, you know, where, where do, what do I do with my music? Where do I go? And CMAA was a great place to connect with people. And even internationally, I'm sure you know, Charles Cole, is one of the um, you know leaders at the CMAA. On that, uh, just just as a, a as a postscript to that, uh, Frank. Yes. I mean, it might be as well um, uh, for for those of you who are thinking along these lines um, to, to to actually send some of your scores to the likes of Charles Cole, who does have this kind of international dimension now, Nicholas. Uh, he, he's, the, he's in charge of music at the, um, the Brompton Oratory yeah. in England. And uh, you know, no, pe people do get scores sent to them. And, and um, I, I, know, I know many, many people who, who operate like that. You know, it, it has to be the way that, you know, I, I think it is true that uh, Catholic music directors are on the lookout for co new choral music all the time. Uh, that might work for the choirs. So the likes of Charles Cole would be a perfect example of someone to send your scores to. Yes, I, yes. I just uh, had one follow-up question, just kind of in the sense that, and I know we're limited on time, but I just wanted to see if what, Sir James, if you consider yourself, I have this trouble a lot of times if I don't want to be pigeonholed as a Catholic composer uh, in the sense that like I write for this particular publishing company that's known for this kind of style of music. Um, for instance, I, I love your In Splendori Boost, a, a choir I used to sing with has a great YouTube clip of it online. That's how I discovered it actually. Um, this is beautiful. And at the same time, I find your, I just discovered another uh, piece by you for three oboes played in a church crypt somewhere. And I was just fascinated by the colors that you got out of the, those instruments um, and how you did that. I just wanted to find the score right away. 
And that's obviously not liturgical music, but I want to write music like that too, that, that does that too. And I'm just curious, um, do you consider yourself a Catholic and then a composer or a Catholic composer? Because uh, I think that makes a difference because a lot of times if we consider ourselves as Catholic composers, we end up, yes, it should inform what we do, but at the same time, it can pigeonhole us into, say, I write, you know, music that's, uh, uh, that's only a particular kind, I guess. Is that making any sense? Yes, absolutely. I've certainly come across this kind of anxiety in, in North America. Uh, I think it, things are, seems to be more clearly delineated over there. Uh, and it shouldn't really be like that. Uh, I mean, if you are writing instrumental music, say for three oboes or um, three cellos or whatever, um, it should find its natural place in the secular world. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't be daunted too much by what people think about, about this. I mean, I mean the, the, the world, uh, if we put the, if we talk it that way, can sometimes be very specific very suspicious of Catholics anyway. And, um, and sometimes but we have all got to sort of uh, uh, struggle a little bit of that. I, I know that even in, in my world, although I've been very complimentary about the, the musical world uh, of, of their open-mindedness and the open-heartedness, I do detect some in some reviews uh, that kind of basically a, a kind of um, slightly anti-religious instinct in, in the way that the the critical fraternity approach um, people at me. And it's not just, uh, you see it in sni rather snide comments about the likes of Goretzky and even Arvo Pert in the, in the early days. And Messiaen, of course, a great modernist was, was uh, s severely um, uh, criticized in very secular France. Uh, but he, 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 he survived and he thrived because he stuck to what he believed and even although many of those secular listeners and audiences didn't really latch on to much of his theology, they saw the beauty and indeed the daring of his work. And eventually uh, his Catholic music cut through all the prejudice that, that exists. Thank you very much. Uh, Tate, Malcolm, can we? Yeah, um, sorry. Hello, uh, Sir James. Thank you so much for this. Uh, this has been a wonderful discussion and I've really enjoyed listening in to everyone's different thoughts and, and your thoughts especially. Um, I, I suspect I'm the youngest one here and I have a bit of an existential question, unfortunately, <laughs> in a sense. Um, I've, I've been composing for the last several years and I love the art of composing, especially as a Catholic. Um, and I also write chamber music and such. Um, but I, I cannot, I can some, I sometimes have this, uh, for lack of a better word, sense of anxiety or even despair at times about my vocation, I guess, as a composer. Um, and I'm a very practical kind of person in, in many ways, but then you have this, I have this great love of music and creating music that is ultimately outside of the church, especially, but, uh, but music itself is not exactly a practical thing. You can't you know, grab a, you know, a drill and a hammer and put something together. It's, it's more abstract. Um, but I guess my question is how, like what advice do you have for somebody like myself who's young, who's just kind of starting out as a composer and you know, as a Catholic composer, um, like what, what advice do you have for somebody like myself and how, sorry, I'm trying to finish this question. Um, did you get a sense of what I'm trying to ask? Sorry. Oh, I muted. it, sorry. Yeah, yes, I think so, yes. Well, um, well I, I don't know if this is a, a Catholic answer or not, but uh, I, I know that I, I meet many young composers who sometimes worry that they, um, you know, especially in the early stages, that what they perceive to be the, the, the musical equivalent of a, a writer's block uh, descends on them and um, silences them. And I've been aware of an anxiety amongst m many of those younger composers. And what I say to them is that we, we, there's, we, we never go completely silent. There may be times when our ideas and music are not as forefront in the brain 
as, as usual. And they, but it doesn't mean they've disappeared. It doesn't mean you've dried up. Perhaps those ideas just go underground. It's like going to sleep with an idea. Um, um, just because you're sleeping uh, with an idea doesn't mean the idea ha has disappeared. It's gone into the subconscious and will perhaps ferment there in a way that allows it to grow and evolve into something much more um, real in the conscious world later on. Um, so I, I know there's a lot of sometimes anxiety about amongst young composers about the, the creative process. So I suppose this is the existential point that you, you're asking, but I, I just encourage, I would, I would um, urge courage uh, and patience. Hmm. Could I follow up actually a little bit? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, I guess uh, part of my kind of uh, anxiety is um, perhaps a little bit career-based in the sense of, do I pursue music with all that I have or should I, and, and, you, and um, I'm, I know you can't answer this entirely, um, but, um, but it, it's more, how do I say this? I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I guess I, 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 can, I can get kind of stuck thinking, you know, yeah. maybe I should um, pursue something else and just do music for fun. Um, but then I, I never know, it's kind of that essential tension between the practical side and the, 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 the side that loves beauty so much within me. Um, I, I, I don't know if you can speak to that. I, I wonder no. if you can speak to that a bit. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I think that um, especially nowadays, uh, young musicians, whether they're composers or not, need a kind of portfolio of skills. Uh, some of those skills will be purely musical and it will be to do with your composition or your practical skills, uh, but there'll be other associated skills that need to be nurtured too. Um, um, your arranging skills, uh, your um, directorial skills, how much of a, an organizer amongst your fellow musicians are you? Also um, being able to write about music to be able to um, analyze music might lead to being able to explain music in a, 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 in a teaching facility. And we need, we need good teachers and explainers of music, people that will encourage another generation to come to music. But I've, I've certainly been aware amongst the, the younger generation of musicians that they, they, they need to be as, have a whole field of possibilities open to them. Uh, and, and sometimes they will settle on one or a, a number rather than others. Um, and, but, some, but sometimes the whole breadth of those skills can actually come into to play uh, in, in, in feeding a, a very um, uh, fulfilled career and indeed vocation in music. When I write a lot, uh, I found that that is a skill or it's certainly an experience that of, of my younger years that's held me in good stead. I've been able to write about music. I've been able to write about culture. I've been able to write and, ex and ex investigate the connections between uh, culture and music and politics and religion. And um, not that it's, it's an important part of my career, but you know, I, I, have, I have one foot in academia and I'm able to talk about lots of these things and that's, I suppose that's part of the portfolio of skills that uh, will become more and more and more increasingly important to musicians in the years ahead. Thank you. Frank, I, I really, Tate, if you'll forgive me, but it reminds me of a conversation I had with my uh, oldest son who is, has a artistic calling um, and his mentor, who was also a young artist, really made a very powerful case to not care about money. And what I told my son is, that is dumb. Every, money should be your servant, not your master, but everyone needs some amount of money. So figure out how to get that uh, or you'll get in trouble. But that the, there is a simple formula for success in life, and that is to serve what you love, what and who you love. I don't know if that's helpful. But. Absolutely, very, very helpful. And um, there's, uh, there's, what, there's also something else I tell 
young composers and it infuriates them no end. I, I say that you, they should also marry a good lawyer. That's what I did. Uh, fascinating. I did not know that Lynn was a lawyer. <clears throat> uh, Joseph. Uh, hello. Um, so James, thank Welcome. you so much for all of this. Um, I, I was kind of trying to think of additional questions to ask. I feel like a lot of the things I've been interested in um, have already come across in this great conversation. Um, but I, I was, I've been thinking about the teaching I do at the conservatory. Um, I teach a composition workshop class for the first year students, and then we follow up in the second year of the curriculum with CounterPoint. Um, and obviously in the first semester of CounterPoint, um, uh, the class is directed towards the style of Palestrina. Um, and so that's kind of foundational to what we're looking at with the students. And I'm, I've really marveled over the last couple of years of how much they uh, how much they are drawn to a sense of tradition and a sense of history and beauty in in um, in that that music. And it's this kind of amazing connection and bridge that we I think all of us on this panel have of um, between our our uh, our spiritual calling and our sacred music and our secular. Um, but one thing we talk about a lot. Uh, uh, that it came from my teacher, David Conti, is the idea of influence and embracing influence and channeling our, our own originality, our gift from God as, as composers through the voices of others and, um, and the composers who came before us. And I, just, I, I would be curious, who, were, who are the influences uh, for you or how do you think about influence in your own music? Well, uh, I've had, I, I had some very good teachers when I was young. Uh, I studied at the Edinburgh, the University of Edinburgh and also the University of Durham. And my teacher at Durham, where I was a postgraduate student, was John Caskin, who was one of that um, one time young group of English modernists, he's about 10 years older than me, who went to places like Poland in the 1970s to study with the likes of Lutoslavsky and so on. So I, uh, I felt open to that experience of modernism. Kenneth Layton uh, was my teacher at Edinburgh. Uh, some, of, some of you involved in church music and organ music might know that name. His music is used a lot in the Anglican church, especially especially in the United Kingdom. He was a great contrapuntalist himself and to be able to sit in classes on counterpoint and, and other things with him was, was a great learning process. But there have been many other teachers that I have not known personally. And uh, some of them have been mentioned um, already, the likes of Olivier Messiaen showed me, for example, how to be a Catholic composer in the modern world and not to care about the brickbats and the criticisms and, uh, and, and just how important and powerful the Catholic message in music can be in modernity. Um, um, there, there have been many figures like him, but also uh, to cite some of the names that you've, you've mentioned, uh, the likes of Palestrina and the great contrapuntalists from the past, uh, whether it's for religious reasons or theological reasons or not, these are composers that teach us today, composers of today, how to handle complexity on a purely practical level line against line, voice against voice, melody against melody. They teach you certain archetypes about complexity, which can have an impact on even how we think about modern complexities, like rhythm against rhythm, um, tonality against tonality. Uh, one learns some archetypal lessons from the deep past, from the great crop contrapuntalists like uh, Palestrina, even J.S. Bach and, and many others. So th these have been my influences and certainly my, my teachers, I think. Thank you. I, want, I wanted to ask that question. So thank you, Joseph, for, for asking it. Um, so Maggie, um, would you like to um, put a bow on this, wrap, it, wrap things up for us as our principal host Sorry, yes, I know. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Sir James. Thanks all of you. I, I do have a couple of thoughts. Um, some of my takeaways here, I'm not a composer, but uh, the, there are, are two big challenges um, that I'm excited about helping to solve. Uh, 
there is a famous sociologist, James Davison Hunter, who he coined the phrase culture wars, but that's not why I'm talking about him. He developed a, a theory of culture in which it's a very simple idea. It is not the individual genius that carries culture, it's the network. So you need bringing together, um, first of all, serving the artist because that's where it starts. Where do artists get the energy to create? And we've heard some of the barriers, right? And it comes from a profound faith that the, we're made in the image of God and creating is one of the ways we can, uh, whether it's in the secular arts or especially in the sacred arts, we can serve him and image him and serve the world. Um, but if you look at the history of where artists get the energy to create, and I, I, I looked at this from the standpoint of the novel at one point in particular, because I'm a writer, but a lot of it is in the small communities that artists form together. Pe people are made for community. And you know, I think of the, particularly the Bronte sisters who just broke out into the uh, English speaking world. But that was after years and years of sitting in this little vicarage in a tiny rural uh, England and what they were doing is writing for each other before any of the rest of us heard that. And I, I see that. Um, so I think just by coming together today, I, I don't, I wanna underscore the importance of what you're doing. Um, but then connecting artists, both with the wider audiences and with the patrons of the arts. One of my takeaways here, and it is something that Frank LaRocca said to me once, which lit up a light bulb in my head, is that um, as wonderful as concert music is, the fact that concerts are the primary commissioners of sacred music is in some ways a deformation of the art. And it's not the problem of the concerts, it's that the church has ceased to be a major patron of the arts. And I really salute Archbishop Cordelioni, who is really leading this vision, uh, both to create community, to encourage and inspire, and, and with our, our, our currently limited budget to commission new works of art. And I think the, the, the modern edition is in, in the Renaissance, only a very few rich people could be patrons of the art but there are really new opportunities um, with technology and with a, an upper middle class society for ordinary uh, people with ordinary, more ordinary incomes to contribute to the creation of the art as, as patrons. And many of you do through B16. So if you're listening, thank you for that. So that, that connection, the, the, the connecting the, finding, helping artists sustain the energy to create, bringing them into community, connecting that community of artists with patrons of the arts and wider audiences is what um, we are kind of ambitiously and even maybe grandiosely trying to do. Uh, but we've learned a fair amount in our first steps and I'm going to be encouraged to look harder at things like building networks of music directors so that um, we can um, make more people aware of the burgeoning number of really fine composers. Um, and so I guess that's the two, the, the, the patronage of the art and, and getting works of art more known. And one of the things we I just throw in is that uh, before the, first celebration as a solemn pontifical high mass of the mass of the Americas. Uh, I got uh, emails from the rector who told me the whole Latin mass society, not, I'm sure it wasn't the whole, but many of them were calling and saying this should be moved from the upper church, which seats like four or 5,000 down to the, the, the grotto church, which is about two or 300 because there was no way we were gonna be able to fill that and it would be an embarrassment to the Latin mass community. 
And I said to the rector, well, we're not a Latin mass society. We don't organize the way they do, but I have an archbishop and we're gonna send him on an earned media tour of in, on television and radio. And I have a really crack digital marketer and we're going to pay to target people in the area who would be interested in coming. And I remember sitting in the pews with Frank before the celebration and uh, an hour before we started to see significant numbers of people sh show up. And he looked at me and said, this is really going to work, isn't it? Uh, in terms of uh, getting people to this mass. And he, Frank is also the one who pointed out to me that the, this problem of getting more than a first hearing of your work is actually not unique to sacred music. It's what composers talk about all the time in new music, right? Getting a first is, is hard, but not so hard. Getting a second performance of a new work of music seems really, really challenging. Um, and Frank also pointed out to me that the first celebration of the Mass of the Americas, this is in the ordinary form in 2018 at St. Mary's Cathedral, 3,500 people were there and that in most new music, obviously not for Sir James, how you break out to be Sir James, I can't tell you, but in most new music, uh, classical music concerts, they're happy if 50 or 100 people show up. So what, what we're doing, and then, and then we're hoping to move music, create a cathedral pipeline, sort of Create, recreating the great Renaissance or counter-reformation model where music is composed from the heart of the church on themes that speak to the contemporary church, but in the great high tradition, sacred music tradition of the church, and then find new audiences by moving through the cathedrals and the basilicas. And I'm hearing that we should also be looking at, at, at versions that are more suitable for smaller uh, for par ordinary parishes, or at least talented musical parishes. And uh, from there, I hope they end up at, uh, you know, Carnegie Hall in a couple of hundred years. So we so much appreciate you. I think this is such an uh, important thing to do. And I hope we all stay connected. Thanks to Sir James. Um, and thanks to Archbishop Cordelione. Yes, um, and let me just say thank you to all those people who joined us uh, today. Uh, thank you for the conversation I've had with, with the, the panel. Uh, and thanks for all those comments. I saw them coming in, uh, uh, those wonderful comments. And if anyone does want to contact me, just, just drop a line to Maggie or Frank and I'm sure they would, would pass it on to me. Um, and, and just one other thing, I'm back with you uh, on the 29th of May and that's a, a lecture uh, called Music and, well, I've forgotten what it's called, actually, Music and uh, Some Wider Implications. So we'll talk about a, a, bit, a, bit, a bigger context in that as well, if you want to come back and, and join me then. Yes, and we will send out a link to all everyone who registered. And also, I would say uh, that will be a, include a Q&A from the audience, I believe. So those of you who've been watching and wanting to, to personally post things will at least get an opportunity on May 29th. Um, I would normally at this point ask Archbishop Cordelione to give us a blessing, but I think I'm simply going to have to say, God bless you all. Um, and thank you for all that all of you here in this panel do and for spending time with us today. Thank you. All the best, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye-bye.